Let us pray. O oh God of life, throughout your word, you have taught us that your way is the way of love. And you have called us to love you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength, and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. 
And, O oh Lord, you have also shown us through the unconditional, unselfish love of your Son that the greatest kind of love is to be willing to lay down our life for our friends. We have been shown that kind of love by these courageous men who were willing to lay down their lives for their friends on the field of battle. These great men who went to war for our country, who proudly wore the uniform, the armed forces of the United States of America. And on this day, we honor them. I pray, O oh God, that this would be pleasing in your sight as we bring honor to them, but we bring glory to you because you are worthy of all glory, almighty God. Lord, throughout your word, we have also seen that it is appropriate to memorialize great things. And as your children, the children of Israel, saw fit to place 12 stones in the Jordan River to remember how you made a way for them to cross the River Jordan into the promised land of Canaan and enter it to remind them of the great deeds that you have done. So we, on this day, memorialize these great and courageous men who have served their country, these sons of Westland, these sons of America, proudly. Let us always be mindful of what they have done, and we give you thanks on this day for them and all the others who have given so freely of themselves. We thank you for this great country we are blessed to be part of. We give you glory and honor and praise for it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning again. My name is Jim Gray, and I'm going to preside over a two-part event this morning. It's very participatory and appropriate. We're going to have a dedication, a solemn affair, as befits this location and these young men. And then we're going to have a break, a break and then a celebration as the other part of this uh, wonderful complex is dedicated. You know, we've been working on this for more than two years to bring us to this day. And I want everybody to know that, that Methodists can make it stop raining, but that we're not yet able to affect the temperature, but we're working on that. I want to welcome back uh, classmates of these young men. I've met four or five of you. Raise your hand who are here with these young men in school. I think we give them a round of applause. For, for coming this way today to honor their, their classmates. We are going to dedicate the Vietnam Memorial Courts, which was the original name when we first built the six courts on this side, and then we're going to have the celebration of this wonderful Slick Family Foundation Tennis Center. To talk about the Memorial Vietnam Memorial Courts, uh, in just a couple of minutes, uh, that will be the pleasure of Bruce Scherer. And he, and Michael Pratt, Lloyd Nelson, Elliot Nelson, and others really created this first project way back. Now, Lloyd is on business in Germany and could not be with us today. Uh, Michael is in the hospital recovering from heart surgery. I knew when we hired him that he would give his heart for this institution, but I didn't mean it literally. But I talked to Michael yesterday. I'm never so surprised. He called me up. This is four days after he had four hours worth of open heart surgery. Uh, and he sounded strong, and he wants to send his best to you today. And we hope that he'll be home towards the end of this week. I want to also give special thanks to Vince Tesoro and his joint He's the chairman of the Joint Veterans Committee of Nash and Edgecombe for participating. I want to thank wonderful architects from Oakley and Collier. I want to thank the contractors, Shamless and, and Rabel with uh, Barnhill. And I want to thank Lauren Loomis Hubble, our CFO, who really managed the construction project. Good morning. 
I know it's chilly, and uh, if I if my voice sounds a little wavery, that's why, because I'm cold. <laughs> I wanted to give just a brief description of our history of how we came up with the first six courts. Uh, back in the mid-1990s, a couple of uh, exceptional Wesley alumni were disappointed to discover that the school had abandoned the tennis program, and in fact, uh, the campus no longer had any tennis courts. So Lloyd Nelson and Fritz Smith put their heads together and came up with a plan to reinduce, reintroduce tennis to Wesley and, of course, build a set of courts. The idea for dedicating the courts to Wesleyan students lost in Vietnam grew out of the fact that one of them had been on the tennis team, and that was Bill Bobbitt. Lloyd had been on the Wesleyan basketball and baseball teams, and Fritz had been on the tennis and soccer teams. So they felt close to the school uh, and athletics here, and they each generously donated one of the original six courts. There was a groundbreaking ceremony. <clears throat> um, I'm actually jumping ahead here. Um, after they had committed to donating the courts, the college then began a campaign within the Wesleyan alumni community and quickly raised the funds for the six original courts. And then in the spring of 1997, there was a, a groundbreaking ceremony with Fritz and Lloyd. And uh, in the fall of uh, 1998, they had the actual dedication of the original six courts. <clears throat> Ten years later, found Wesleyan tennis becoming a force in college tennis, but badly in need of more appropriate facilities. And about that same time, a group of Wesleyan alumni who had provided support for the original courts had realized for some time that a more fitting memorial itself needed to be for the classmates that were lost. So a committee was formed to design an appropriate memorial, which you see out front, to be integrated with the new tennis complex being planned. Uh, and that's basically, in a nutshell, the history of how we came about with the memorial and the original courts, uh, a fitting reminder to the fine young classmates who never grew old, Bill Bobbitt, Paul Nance, Dwayne Maddox, Bill Zimmerman, and Butch Harvey. So I will segue into the next part here. We're very honored uh, to have General Shelton here today. General Henry Hugh Shelton was born in Tarboro, North Carolina, and grew up on a small farm situated halfway between the communities of Hobgood and Speed. General Shelton attended NC State University where he received a bachelor's degree in textiles. He also received a master's degree in political science from Auburn University. In 1963, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the infantry through the Reserve Officers Training Corps. General Shelton attended Ranger training and went to Vietnam as a first lieutenant in 1966 serving two tours of duty during which he earned a, bron a Bronze Star for Valor and a Purple Heart. Following his return to the States, General Shelton served in a variety of command and staff positions, including commanding the 3rd Battalion, 60th Infantry in the 9th Infantry Division at Fort Lewis, Washington, commanding the 1st Brigade, Brigade of the 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and serving as the Chief of Staff of the 10th Mountain Division at Fort Drum, New York. In 1987, after being selected for Brigadier General, General Shelton, Shelton served in the Operations Directorate of the Joint Staff. A two-year assignment followed as Assistant Division Commander for Operations of the 101st Airborne Division, Air Assault, and a seven-month deployment to Saudi Arabia for Operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Back in North Carolina after the Gulf War, General Shelton was promoted to Major General and assumed command of the 82nd Airborne Division. In 1993, he was promoted to Lieutenant General and took command of the 18th Airborne Corps. 1994 saw General Shelton in Haiti commanding the Joint Task Force, which conducted Operation Uphold Democracy. 
In March 1996, he became Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Special Operations Command. Then in 1997, General Shelton became the 14th Chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff and served two two-year terms before his retirement in 2001. During his time as Chairman, U.S. forces were in heavy demand and participated in numerous joint operations around the globe. General Shelton led with distinction and has earned honors, many honors and awards for numerous, numerous military and civilian organizations in the U.S. and overseas. Throughout his career, he has worked tirelessly on behalf of service members, their families, and military retirees by promoting a number of landmark quality of life initiatives. In recognition of his exemplary service to our country, the 107th Congress bestowed the Congressional Gold Medal on General Shelton in 2002. Currently, General Shelton serves as Executive Director of the General Hugh Shelton Leadership Center at North Carolina State University and as Director of the Hugh and Carolyn Shelton Military Neurotrauma Foundation. He has been a loyal supporter of Westland, and we are proud to welcome him as a new member to our Board of Trustees. Please join me in welcome, welcoming General Hugh Shelton. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for that very warm welcome, and I'll tell you, it's a great honor and privilege to be with, me, be with you here today. Mayor Combs and President Gray, Chairperson Johnson and fellow trustees, fellow Vietnam veteran, veterans that are here today and all of our veterans. In fact, I would like to ask our veterans if you would please stand and let us recognize you, regardless of which war <laughs> or service. Thank you. A warm welcome also to all of our Westland students and our, our ROTC students that are here today as well. It's wonderful to be here and have a chance to share with you this morning this ceremony as we pause to honor and pay respect and remember the five members of the Westland family who unselfishly gave their lives for our country. They, like thousands of others, answered the call to duty. It was the same call to duty that our veterans have answered throughout our nation's history when required. And these five individuals that we honor today did not seek personal gain or a path to fame. Their country called and they answered. They answered and a simple patriotic response as they carried out their civic duty. But the war in which they served, the one which cost them their lives, turned out to be different from most of the other wars that America has participated in. It was a war that spanned three presidencies. We had Kennedy, Nixon, and Johnson. It lasted over 10 years. And of course, it cost the lives of these five men that we honor today. It was a war that cost America over 47,000 killed and over 153,000 wounded in action. To many seated here today, in particular those that have hair the color of mine or no hair, as the case may be, it seems like yesterday. But the truth is, it was 47 years ago, in 1964, when the President ordered Lieutenant General Westmoreland, at that time the commander of Fort Bragg, to Vietnam, along with the 5th Special Forces Group that was also at Fort Bragg, to Nha Trang, Vietnam. Congress, as a result of the attacks in the Tonkin Gulf, had passed the Tonkin Re Resolution, which authorized the President or empowered him to increase U.S. involvement in Vietnam. And then for the next 10 years, hundreds of thousands of Americans would serve in our armed forces, 
in battles that would rage across Vietnam, as we also used defoliants to help the ground forces, and as well as the, started the bombings of North Vietnam. But during that same period, back here in the U.S., protests started against the war, and they raged as our citizens started to view the war as a tremendous drain on America's resources. The political process was failing badly to convince the American people that this was, in fact, a war worth fighting, much less a war that was in, that was in America's vital national interests. On the battlefields of Vietnam and in the surrounding sea and rivers, as well as in the air over North and South Vietnam, that meant very little to our great soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, that were carrying out the orders of their Commander-in-Chief. Just as the men we honor today did, they were doing their nation's bidding. They came from across the land, from the farms, from the factories, from the fields, most drafted into the arms, armed forces, and they served side by side. They fought for each other. They fought to win the battles that they were engaged in, and they fought to make their nation proud. But back in the U.S., once again, their fellow citizens began to confuse the war with the role of the soldier, with the political process, which by 1970 was under direct attack on all fronts. From the Paris peace talks in 1970 up till the last evacuee, evacuee went out in a helicopter in 1975, the anti-war protests intensified because, of, once again, we were failing to convince our citizens that this was a worthy cause and hence maintain political support for the war that was still raging in Vietnam. The troops that were returning often faced indifference from their own countrymen. Even worse, in many cases, they bore the brunt of an unpopular political decision as their own citizens con confused their noble and honorable service and sacrifices with the politics of the war. Fortunately, today, surveys across America show that 90 over 90 percent of Americans today hold Vietnam veterans in high esteem, and 75 percent clearly understand that it was a political uh, process that failed vice the military. The men that we honor today, these five great Americans, are symbolic of America's commitment to peace, to freedom, and to democracy. Their willingness to serve stands as a great example of America's commitment to those values. And this memorial in their honor will be a constant reminder to all that view it of their selflessness, their courage, and their commitment to our nation's values. It will also show the respect that Westland has for its students and alumni who serve their nation and answer the call to duty. President Abraham Lincoln once remarked that speeches and statues aren't adequate repayment for those that give their lives for their country. He was right. The debt that we owe requires a commitment on our part. And it is a commitment that each of us must have to the principles of our nation and the personal sacrifices that are sometimes required to defend those principles and to preserve them. This memorial will stand as a constant reminder of that. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the greatest gift that we can give to these five Westland alumni, great veterans of this college and this country and they earned it. May God bless you, may God bless this college, and may God continue to bless our great nation. Thank you very much. I am honored to assist in the recognition of North Carolina Wesleyan College alumni who gave their lives to the cause of freedom during the Vietnam War. Some of these men were my classmates and I knew them well. Others, I did not know personally, 
but they all had my respect beyond words. When I reflect on my carefree days here at Wesleyan, I have some great memories and I have some wonderful warm memories. But in other reflections, I am sobered and humbled by the reality of the supreme sacrifice made by these brave Wesleyan alumni who served in the U.S. military. In honoring them today, we are reminded of their courage and of that of all American soldiers, men and women, past and present, who strive to protect the freedom for us and for people around the world. Now, I would like to tell you a little about each of these men we are honoring today. Although their days were filled with family and friends and many experiences, we have limited our comments to give you only a brief glimpse of the boys they were and the men they became. William E.G. Bobbitt was born January 2, 1943, Norfolk, Virginia. He came to Wesleyan as a freshman in 1963 and immediately embraced campus life. He was a strong athlete, as you've heard before. Uh, he served on the social committee. He was on the uh, orientation committee. He was elected president of the monogram club. When classes ended, you were looking for Bill Bobbitt, you would find him in the dance room. Because believe it or not, he loved to jitterbug. Uh, he was also one of Wesleyan's best ping pong players. And Bill Bobbitt always acted and dressed with such class. He always wore well-starched blue shirts with his monogram across the pocket. And sometimes he even wore a tie to dinner. Uh, I recall that he had an incredible uh, 50s rock and roll record collection. It was something we all envied, and he had a love for that music that was unsurpassed. U.S. Army Lieutenant, Lieutenant William Bobbitt served as an infantry, command, infantry unit commander. Bill Bobbitt died at age 25 in combat on February the 22nd in Yan Din Province, South Vietnam. Cleveland R. Harvey was born on June 16, 1947, Alexandria, Virginia. He joined the Wesleyan student body in 1966 as a freshman. Fondly known as Butch, he played on the baseball and the soccer teams and was a member of the degree staff. One of Butch's passions was skin diving or scuba diving. And I understand that as a sideline, he and some of his fellow Wesleyan entrepreneurs worked by contract to extract golf balls from the lakes and ponds of the local Rocky Mountain golf course, thus turning his advocation into a little vocation. <laughs> U.S. Marine Corps First Lieutenant Cleveland Harvey served in the infantry. Butch Harvey died at age 23 in a combat-related helicopter crash on November 18, 1970 in Guanham, uh, South Vietnam. Dwayne E. Maddox, born July 1, June 1, 1944, Virginia Beach, Virginia. He arrived on the North Carolina campus in 1963 as a member of the freshman class. Music was one of Dwayne's talents and passions. I understand that it was a rare day when you walked by his dorm room that you didn't hear him strumming his guitar and singing the songs of Peter, Paul, and Mary, such as Leaving on a Jet Plane, Puff the Magic Dragon, and sadly, Where Have All the Flowers Gone? These were some of his favorites. U.S. Air Force Captain Dwayne Maddox was trained as a pilot. Captain Maddox died at age 26 in a downed airplane on August 10, 1970 in Hanwha Province, South Vietnam. Paul M. Nance, Jr., born May 31, 1944, Washington, North Carolina. He came to Rocky Mount in the fall of 1963 to join the freshman class. One of the few really quite pre quiet presences on the, on the North Carolina Wesleyan campus. Had there been a contest for a Mr. Really Nice Guy, Paul would have clearly been a finalist. He was a nice, great young man. U.S. Army Sergeant Paul Nance served in the infantry. Sergeant Nance died at the age of 23 in combat at Tu Han Tin, South Vietnam, having been called back on very short notice for his second tour of duty. 
William E. Zimmerman, Jr. was born August 5, 1942, Frederick, Maryland. He was a member of the junior class in 1965. Ironically, Bill Zimmerman and Bill Bobbitt were Wesleyan roommates. They were also doubles partners in tennis, and they were great friends. Zimmerman, who lettered in football, baseball, and tennis in high school, was an exceptional athlete and known to his Wesleyan friends as one of the great guys on campus. U.S. Army First Lieutenant William Zimmerman served as an infantry unit commander and died at age 25 on April 28, 1968, in a heroic death in a horrific battle at Chumor Mountain in the Central Highlands of North Vietnam. First Lieutenant Zimmerman was awarded the Bronze Star with a V for Valor. In a moment, we will honor these five fine young men with a memorial flag ceremony and a rifle salute provided by North Carolina Wesleyan Army ROTC with support from some of our local veterans.
All right, well, we're going to change uh, change the pace and put a smile on our face and uh, move to a celebration. This is a wonderful day. Uh, I want to go into various recognition of people. I tried to uh, divide them into some kind of logical order. Hopefully, I won't forget anybody, but there were so many people, like any project like this, so many people involved. And as you know, this project meshed with uh, Rocky Mount's bid for the uh, 2013 and 14 conference championships. And most of you know that story, those two efforts to do the courts and get the tournament uh, meshed. Early on, and uh, he'll have a, a little role in just a minute, early on the, the, the Wesleyan family members who really bought into this idea that we could build the, uh, the finest tennis center in this part of the country uh, included Tom Betts, raise your hand Tom, and Bell Johnson, our board chair, <laughs> Lloyd Nelson, uh, John Thompson, our athletic director, they and, um, uh, and others, and the players. Players, please stand up. All these people didn't laugh. They didn't say we couldn't do it when the idea first came up. It started as we were just going to refinish these original six courts, and then the dream began from there. And those original believers uh, gave me the momentum to go forward and, and, and do what we were able to do. There's a group of people who I call the public servants. Some of them work for government. Some just serve the public. And those include early adopters that we got involved in this project were Mayor David Combs, our city manager, Charles Penny. I haven't seen Charles today. Couldn't be here, but please tell him that we miss him. Robbie Davis, where are you? Raise your hand, Robbie. Robbie's a, a Nash County Commissioner. He's chairman of the uh, uh, Tourism Development Authority of Nash County. Uh, Martha Lamb. Now, I can't believe Martha's not here. Where is she? Martha Lamb, you know, uh, you know, I invited her 12 times to this thing. I want to make sure she got, because uh, she bought into it early and you know the rest of the story. Rita Wiggs, our commissioner. Rita waves her hand. She's back there. This is, I think, her third trip to Rocky Mount from Fayetteville in the last week or so. It was Robin Jones with the United States Tennis Association, and she couldn't be here, but one of her colleagues is here. And of course, Dale Smith. Stand up, Dale. Dale. And then the donors. Uh, the donors are, are many. Uh, Tom, uh, come on up here. We're going to unveil this donor plaque in just a second. Come on up, Tom. Uh, those of you who don't know Tom, he's a member of our Board of Trustees. He's a former banker and insurance executive. He. Uh, He's a fundraising king, and when he said, let's go for it, that meant something. And I've never seen anything like it, uh, the people on the back wall. <laughs> I've been involved in a lot of money raising, but I've never seen anything like Tom Betts on this tennis center, <laughs> i got to tell you. Uh, the city, the Parks and Recreation uh, got involved. The TDA, of course, contributed, and there are many foundations uh, up here, you'll see their their name. These are community foundations. When they heard the story, that what we wanted to do is not just win this tournament and have a great tennis center, but provide a place where the, the city uh, uh, residents could come and play. And I don't know if you saw our ad in Sunday's paper, but when the city put money into it and the county put money into it, it was obvious that what we needed to do, and that is invite the community. So anybody who can pick up a tennis racket. 
okay, at any time, as long as, you know, uh, it's not 12 o'clock at night, uh, can come and play. And as long as our tennis team is not out there. So we have dubbed these the community courts. And that, that was a strong message that uh, got a lot of positive response. The USTA put in $35,000 in the construction. You'll see that a lot of the courts are lined off with, for children's clinics, and they have a first serve program that we'll be doing with the city. And then the Slick Family Foundation. There's Martha. Let's give Martha a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> I just talked about you, Martha, and it was all good. But the Slick Foundation is uh, never, ever seeks recognition. Uh, to the contrary, it avoids recognition. But Phyllis Cowell, our trustee, and Lynn Ives um, with that foundation are here today. And Lynn has graciously agreed to... to uh, to help us do the our first serve. And uh, so without further ado, uh, Mr. Mayor, if you would come up with uh, Dr. Betts here and we'll see if we can get this thing without pulling the bricks out. <laughs> All right, let's give it, a, give it a little pull here. All right, let's hear it. Uh, I, first off, I do want to make a remark. Uh, we are grateful that General Shelton and his wife Carolyn could be here today with us today. Uh, they had to leave, but uh, we're glad that they were here in Rocky Mount. As I look over at my friend Norman Chambliss back in 1969, we both graduated from high school. And the, the day I graduated, I had to go register for the draft. And so my number was 304, so I was pretty lucky. I, I knew I probably wasn't going to be drafted at that point in time, but I did have friends and classmates that that went to Vietnam and didn't come home. And uh, I'm grateful for Weston College for doing this today. I said in the past, one of my proudest days uh, in Rocky Mount is when we dedicated the Veterans Memorial downtown. And I'm also equally as proud today that we dedicated this memorial today. So thank you for that. Um, I also want to recognize Council Member Chris Miller and Council Member W.B. Bullock that also were part of the decision for the city to participate in this fine facility, and um, I'm not sure which one is worse, Tom Betts or Jim Gray, when they get their mind made up to do something. Uh, it seems like they find a way and they keep pushing at it, so thank you both for your, your efforts in doing this. You know, when the city took a look at this, uh, if you look across the state or the country, uh, most cities that have, and towns that have a college or university with them, they have partnerships. They work together uh, to make things happen in the community, and in Rocky Mount, you know, Wesleyan College has been out here for an awful long time, uh, over 50 years, and for a long time it, it felt removed somewhat from the city because we're not right in the middle of the city like some of the other universities are. But with the Tom Betts Freeway here and with business coming out in this community and with the uh, advent of the development Forwards College, which I think now is the preserve at Belmont and still going to be uh, developed, you know, Westland is becoming uh, really in, inside the city with things developing all around it. One of the things that we wanted at the city, though, is if we invested in this, we wanted to have people in the community to be able to participate at this facility. Uh, we have a long history in Rocky Mount of great athletics, great athletes that come out of this community. And uh, our, our investment in the sports complex that we made in Rocky Mount has been undoubtedly one of the biggest uh, home runs we've ever hit, uh, one of the best investments that we've ever made. One of the things that we didn't have, though, was a, was a world-class tennis facility. And now we have it here on the uh, campus of North Carolina Western College. So like Jim said, this is available not just to North Carolina Wesleyan College and the tennis players, and I hope you have a good season this year. Uh, you all look mighty young to me. Uh, <laughs> but also to the citizens of Rocky Mount. And that was important to us, uh, investing in this. I think, Robbie, I can speak for you. That was also probably important for, um, for Robbie. But it allows us not only to, to have great tennis here at North Carolina Westland, but also to invite other tournaments that might be available to this area to bring also people in for tourism that would come to our community and spend some time in Rocky Mount. 
So uh, it's a great partnership. We hope to continue to um, partner with North Carolina Western College. Uh, one of the, some of the best partnerships in the country today are private-public partnerships. And this is a great example of it. And there were a lot of people. And, and Reed, I want to thank you, the commissioner, again, for being here today. We had to take something on faith. And that was we didn't have the tournament at that time, but we had to make a commitment to go ahead and build this facility because we wouldn't have had time to do it if we'd have waited to, to make sure we had the tournament and then build the facility. So we had to, we had to go on faith. And thanks to, to Jim and Tom and some other efforts, uh, we, we got it done, and it's a great facility, and Tim Oakley did a great job. Norman, y'all did a great job. And so thank you all for being here today. It's a wonderful day for the city of Rocky Mount and North Carolina Western College and Nash County. So thank you for being here, and I'm uh, looking forward to it.